Welcome to Lifestyle by Design, helping you solve everyday challenges. I'm Karen Jacobs, a professor at Boston University and a Brookline Rotarian, and here's my co-host. Hi, and I'm Andrea Kelso. Today, we are so excited for our special guest, Marjan Love. She is an occupational therapist. <laughs> she also has her own TV show, and she is an author. And we are so excited to have you here today. Thank you so much for joining us. Well, thank you for having me. Thank you. And we've known each other for about 30 years. Shh. <laughs> <laughs> and, and your career has really evolved. And you, as a person, has evolved in doing so many very interesting things. So where should we start? Hmm. I became an OT because uh, at my junior high school, some nasty boys took the blind boy, grabbed his cane, spun him around, stole his backpack and his lunch, and ran off. And those same boys, about oh, two weeks later, took a young fellow with cerebral palsy and threw him headfirst down the stairs, yelling, you cripple. And I found that distressing and offensive and I cried to my father and he said, well, you know, you can do something about this. You could take a positive action and you could do something about this. And so I went into my high school guidance counselor because I had exceptionally high scores in mechanical reasoning and spatial relationships, which normally you'd go to engineering or architecture, but back in the 1960s, women were not accepted into architecture or engineering, but they were accepted into occupational therapy. And uh, my avid interest was art. I loved art. And so I came to Boston with this crazy set of circumstances, someone else at my high school in Pensacola, New Jersey, had been studying the Boston area. They wanted to come to Boston. So I'm looking through Boston University's folder, and here are all these gorgeous pictures of Boston College's campus. <laughs> so I show up at uh, West Campus. I got late admission, someone with like, I think she was, uh, you know, a wonderful scholar, got last minute acceptance into Cornell. And I got her room on the 50 yard line when BU still had a football team. Oh boy. Yeah, and guess who didn't watch football? <laughs> <laughs> it was kind of crazy. That's and Braves Field. Uh, uh, that was Bra that's yeah, Braves yeah. Field. So the Red Sox were there at one point. Too. Yeah. So it, it was it was kind of crazy. Um, but who did your guidance counselor know about occupational? Therapy? Yes, my so guidance. So that was unusual at that time in the '60s. Well, 70s. we're talking we're talking late '60s, okay. and what he thought was that OTs figured out how to help people with their activities of daily living. People who had brain tumors, been in car accidents, had amputations. And um, one of my early mentors was Fred Sammons, the gadget man. Very dapper, had the shock of white hair, and he would come to all the conferences. And uh, he had come up with a Velcro for Velcro sneakers. The guy was the only rich OT any of us knew. <laughs> and uh, yeah, so is he still around? He, sure he was old when I was no, young. He's still, he's still, he'll, be, he'll be around forever. I hope, I hope. He was, he was such a smoothie. But he did things like we were dealing with uh, a disease, ALS, which has a nickname, Lou Gehrig's disease. And it paralyzes people in their body and then works its way out to the extremities. So people get very weak in the shoulders. And I was trying to cope with this with a patient, and he got me interested in a deltoid aid, which is a rig that goes behind the wheelchair that suspends the weight of the arms so that the person can feed themselves. And through him, I got this particular patient a scooper dish. So and a weighted spoon that the spoon would hang 
because there, and that comes in later with people with tremor and people with um, ataxia, people who can't use their hand properly because they're in a splint and the, the item is in the splint. So f he came up with uh, the spork. So if you had someone with intact sensation, they could cut their meat, stab nothing, it, nothing, right? and put it in their mouth all with one utensil and still eat a spoon like soup or whatever, all with one utensil. I've now even seen something like that, that's um, a spoon that almost has like a, a stabilization counterweight so that if you have a tremor, for example, and you go, the spoon stays stable. Right. That makes me think. She even used the right terminology. Did you hear that? <laughs> so yeah, she's not an OT. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Oh, she's I'm not off on you. Off on she's not an OT. No. No. Oh, wait a minute. You're not an OT. No, I thought there was not. the three no. of us chickens here. <laughs> no, oh. no, no, I'm the outsider perspective, I guess you could say. But but you know, it's interesting. Um, Fred invented and patented many many products during that time, and he had his own company. Fred oh Simons yeah, yeah. We would all get the thistle. catalogs. Yeah, um, and so he was an excellent role model for you. Oh yeah, he was. You were so lucky because he was—he was a MacGyver. Huh. And this makes me think back to what you said at the very beginning about wanting being interested in engineering and um, perfect. How much invention has to have gone into? Well, not just that, but social awareness too. Because I—I yeah. I remember I was at a uh, Jerry Lewis event and. One of his audience stood up and said, please, don't do this handicapped walk. I know you think it's funny, but um, I have a neurological impairment, and when I fall down, it isn't funny. It isn't funny to my family that this is slowly killing me. And he responded by coming up with the telethon. No, do you know how much money that man raised for handicapped people with that telethon? And to tell you how old I am, see this white hair? Uh, I used to work for California Crippled Children's Services. Oh, right. Not very politically correct Oh, uh, no, no. <laughs> but um, one of the things that I did early on, I was a student at BU, and uh, I was at Garden City Activity Center in Brookline and I had a friend who's a special educator who is very politically active. He was involved with the Democratic Party and they were working on the beginnings of the Americans with Disabilities Act. It had not even been written, they were writing it. And they wanted a logo. They wanted a logo uh, for accessibility and this Danish woman submitted a beautiful um, line drawing, pen and ink, of a wheelchair in three-quarter view. So it was in perspective. And they turned it down for several reasons, um, even though she was a masterful artist. And I was asked, could you come up with something? You're artistic, because I did arts and crafts. I did old-fashioned OT, arts and crafts, at the Garden City Activity Center. The uh, directress walked in to this, uh, I think it was VFW or Legion Post, and said, you need to provide community service. And I have these young people who are graduating high school, but they aren't 21, and they're falling through the gap, and I need a place for them. Well, they gave her a room, and they built her a ramp. And the next thing we knew, we had the Garden City Activity Center. Yeah. So OTs were very politically active in the beginning. We had to be. We had very little funding, very little um, cachet. People didn't know who we were. Everybody understands what a physical therapist does. They make you stronger, and they help you walk again. People didn't understand that OTs work in a vast array of areas, and uh, we work on feeding and dressing and bathing and driving and doing the laundry, and God forbid you took the early birth control pills, had your baby, and had a stroke on the table, because 
long-term birth control pill than the baby, you could have a stroke. And so here you had a brand new baby and one of your arms is paralyzed. How do you diaper a baby with one hand? OTs try to figure these things out. And so I, I worked um, down in Philadelphia for a while. I wound up moving out to California and for a while I worked in neurology and I had a neurosurgeon tell me, OT and neurosurgery are alike. They're the art and science of coping with human devastation. Oh, isn't that interesting? Wow. The art and science of dealing with human, human devastation. Wow. Yeah, and what I... It's heavy. <laughs> yeah. It is, but I mean, when um, Superman, mm -hmm. okay, yeah was injured in a steeplechase, he wound up in a rehab not very far from where I grew up in New Jersey. And his OT said, you cannot think of what you cannot do. You have to think of what is still possible. Because he was the highest living spinal cord injury at the time. Um, there was a neurosurgeon in the stands and ran out and did immediate chiropractic and took the pressure off his spinal cord and he lived when most people in his situation would have died. He went on to be a director from his sip and puff motorized wheelchair. We developed motorized wheelchairs. When I was working on my master's in uh, University of Nebraska, I did most of it in Lincoln and then I did my neonatal intensive care unit work in Omaha, which is quite a commute, I think 76 miles back and forth. So 150 mile commute in a day. But I was interested in helping premature babies. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that OTs did in those days, we did a lot of feeding. So one of my jobs was to come up with an orthotic that went in the mouth of cleft palate babies so they could nurse so that there was enough suction for them to nurse. My uh, oldest patient was um, the first black doctor in Philadelphia. He was 106 years old. And they were going to come in and do a television show of his 106th birthday. And he came down and he said, can you help me? They're gonna want me to eat in public and I'm blind. And uh, even though he was 106, he was sharp as a tack and had a great sense of humor. He used to tease us all about how he buried six women. He'd been married <laughs> six times and, you know, he, he, he was a pistol. But anyway, he was very bright, very tuned in. And so I taught him the clock method of eating in a divided dish. Oh, share, share that. Um, think about... 12 o'clock to between 3 and 6 is a division. And you have your starch, rice, potatoes, corn, in the 1 to 3 quadrant. Your meat is in the largest quadrant. This is before we had the food pyramid. <laughs> and your vegetable was between 9 and midnight. And so I taught him where these were and made sure he had a scoop edge dish. And... Um, he ate his lunch, and then he had his cake, and he fed himself. What he didn't want is for them to feed him mm. on television. He would be humbled. He would be humiliated. And afterward, he came down, and he cried, and he thanked me. I was so overwhelmed. This was like my first job out of BU. I'm like, I'm at the uh, Philadelphia General Hospital, and this famous man who's been on television is weeping thanks to me for something I didn't invent. But you helped find a solution. Exactly. My mentor said to me, yeah, but you knew what to apply and when. And I think for young OTs, we used to have this red book. Anna Dean Scott and Kathy Trombley, and Both we called it the OT Bible. Mm -hmm. It was called the OT Bible, and anything you needed to know was in that book. Everything from, you know, NICU to orthopedics to hospice care. A lot of OTs work in hospice care. 
I found that I was very sensitive and what I really wanted to go into was graphic arts and I wanted to get in at the beginning at computers and my father said, artists starve to death, you have to work in healthcare to make a living, seriously. And so I got pushed into OT and there were things like, I can remember my first hand injury, getting a stomach ache at this mangled hand, I could not do it. Or um, I tried working juvenile oncology. I couldn't do that either. And then I went and I get this master's degree, three years of my life, and at the time a lot of money, $27,000 in tuition, which is nothing by today's standards. But at that time, that was a third of a house, okay, just to put it in perspective. And um, I couldn't lose the babies. I got too attached. Mm -hmm. So I wound up doing a lot of my work in residential facilities, people that were fairly stable. And I got to do old-fashioned arts and crafts OT, which for me, that was, that was a real blessing. It was a way to occupy your time. And over the course of my career, recreation therapy came in and took over that role and I kind of I missed the bingo <laughs> I missed I I liked the problem solving I liked fitting wheelchairs and that kind of thing um you know it's our 100th anniversary in occupational year. therapy and one of the things that I did this year um, with my students is um, they learned basket weaving no kidding in honor and in fact <laughs> next Next week, one of my um, colleagues, Nancy McRae, is coming down from Maine, and she's going to teach basket weaving to my cohort of students this year as well, because you know, the arts and crafts movement was very powerful in mm -hmm. occupational therapy. And I have a, a really good understanding why it's not something that we can do on a regular basis. But I think as you go back and reflect on the history, especially when it's our hundredth anniversary. It's good to go back and try, and see what it's like, and see um, how it fit into the evolution of our profession. Well, and the students love it. There was a practical aspect too. Of course. Um, in the VA hospital that I worked at for a while in Philadelphia, we would take cut road tires that had been drilled on a drill press, and people would do upper extremity exercise putting these tires, pieces of tires, together on metal frames that were then sold. And they were people's doormats. And the person who typically lived in the hospital, that was their only source of cash income. That's great, a little bit of like supportive employment. Yes, it was, it was OT originated in France um, as the moralist movement. And yeah, and what happened was there were people who would take young prostitutes and throw them in jail or stone them to death or hang them. It was very negative and the blame was on the young prostitute. And some people got together and said, wait a minute, if you talk to these people, most of the young women are orphaned or abandoned by their husband. They have no saleable skill. And they're doing this degrading activity to survive. And they came up with moralist treatment so that they were rehabilitated. They were taught a living skill, making feather dusters or making fancy appliques for ladies' hats or whatever, so that they had a saleable skill other than being abused. And so when I, uh, I, I retired from working full time a couple of years ago, and I started to write my book, yeah, Saigon's Deadly Game. Oh, tell us what that, what that is. So what this is, it's a vintage photograph of a young girl whose village is burning in Vietnam. And it's during the Vietnam War. And the story is about this young girl, Tu Kim, who's an orphan who's kidnapped by pimps. And a young American medic sees this 12-year-old on the street corner. And the pimp 
is little and scrawny and skinny, and he snatches her away, takes her halfway across town and says, it's okay, you can go home to your mother. And she says to him, they killed my mother. I have no mother. I can never go home. And so the story is about Tu Kim, who is called the little fish. She's a lure in a gambling game. And the medic who falls for the bait, that's what the story's about. And the, the plot is, are they going to live? It's a deadly game. And two sides are betting, will they live or will they not live? So this is um, talking about the character. Was that a real character, or did you? Um, come a up lot as of young women. Fiction? Yeah, a lot of young women um, found themselves in dire straits during the Vietnam War. And I had a high school classmate who was drafted, became a POW, and then came back to the United States. And so um, I have two characters take his story. I have Sam Davis survive the torture because he was tortured in the, as a prisoner of war. And I have Derek Martle Johnson, who's the medic, who gets to be the hero, okay? So that guy's the hero, and he gets captured. So you see the torture in retrospect. How was it treated? How was it dealt with? You don't have to live through this man's torture. And then you get to see the capture, and Derek Martel Johnson winds up in one of these huts. And so it's a very deep, it's a heavy book, but um, it's very timely. We've just had uh, the PBS series and NBC is carrying it of Vietnam, so we're coming up on um, also, you know, you were talking about the 100th anniversary of OT. We're at the 50th anniversary of the Corporation for Public Broadcasting. And one of the things I did to kind of make my face known and my name known was I started my own television show. Ooh, how long ago was that? Uh, we're entering our fifth year. We just finished show number 50. Wow. Congratulations. <laughs> that is an accomplishment. <laughs> well, I only do one a month, and um, it takes me a month to do a show. I have to come up with the main theme, and every show I try to put in something thought-provoking, maybe political. I put in something sweet or n nostalgic. Um, I try to put in, um, I break the fourth wall. I talk directly to the camera. And um, I, when I started our little studio at kpntv.org uh, did not have a teleprompter. And so I would bring in little items as mnemonic devices so that I could keep track of what I was saying because my first two shows were a public protest against the closing of the federal government. I found that offensive and distressing, which people that we elected to Congress would shut down the government. It made me crazy. So I did a citizen's rant, 55 minutes. A lot of people were upset about it. They said, come back and do another one. They're still out, so I did. And then they went back to work. And the Red Sox won, and um, I came in in a red cowboy hat. <laughs> I was all dressed in red. And it happened to be like Halloween at the time. We were coming into Halloween. And then the next thing I knew, it was Christmas, and do you want to do a holiday show? And I'm kind of a, a unique individual. I was raised Catholic. I left the Catholic Church and became Buddhist, and then I married a Protestant. So I'm kind of like a polyglot of religions. <laughs> I like that term. <laughs> so um, I talk about similarities and differences between Buddhism and Christianity from the sects that I know, because there are many 
sects of Buddhism, there's five major families of Buddhism, and we know how many religious groups that are Christian. So like my, my last show, I was talking about Christmas used to be the birthday of Jesus, and I had a portrait of Jesus that my grandmother used to hang in her home, and I showed that. So my show is sort of show and tell. I do like a Fred Rogers thing, and I bring in stuff, and I show and tell. And in the beginning, it was vital, because like I said, that was how I kept on track. I have a 55-minute show. What's the name of the show? It's called Marjan's Musings, and it's on YouTube. Uh, under Marjan Love, and it's also on capantv.org. So if anybody wanted to click that, that's good for my public access station. That's like your station. You're here in a high school. Yeah, we're in an industrial park. <laughs> yeah, we are. And then because this book was sad, um, you know, the little girl shows up in the first chapter is a ghost. Oh, Does wow. she live? Mm -hmm. Probably not if she's in the first. I didn't want titillation. Are they going to kill the girl? There's so much media of are they going to rape the woman? Are they going to kill the girl? I did not want that focus. Mm -hmm. You know from the get-go she dies. Mm -hmm. It's not dun dun dun. <laughs> It's all the wonderful things she, the medic, and the medic's comrades do to try to save her. And they try to save themselves. And then this one was kind of like, I don't know, 795 pages. Where can somebody find your book? On Amazon. On Amazon, Amazon. Say yeah. The name, say the name one more time. It's called Saigon's Deadly Game, and it's on Amazon.com. So the next one I wrote is um, Sam's West Coast Adventures, where the sidekick in this book gets to come home, and the serious part is he has PTSD. This is the fellow that was tortured, mm -hmm. badly, badly tortured, but he lives thanks to this medic who becomes his best friend. And uh, he gets a Harley and he goes across country and he has adventures. He tries to save a damsel in distress and it comes out quite a bit better than Saigon's Deadly Game. Uh, I don't want to do a spoiler on my own book, but. So these, so these books again are on Amazon. How long did it take you to write a book like this? Uh, Saigon's Deadly Game was three years. Sam's West Coast Adventure was about six, seven months to write. It's a shorter, lighter book. It has a warlock and zombies and mm -hmm. magical cats and a love affair. And it's, it's a much more upbeat book. And the veteran... Um, who's been drinking and gambling hard, goes tea. He decides he's going to give up drinking. And you watch him do this up the coast of California. It's kind of interesting. It was a way for me to take my experience with my loving husband, where we lived in San Diego, and we would go up the coast to L.A. or whatever, and I could talk about sights and scenes and stuff because it set at the time that I lived in California. It's true, true. It's to my, yeah, yeah. <laughs> now, am I an undercover police officer named Jerry? No. <laughs> but you will find him in the book. And uh, so the warlock was fun because he curses them with a time curse. And so they flip through time. So that was kind of interesting to write. A fantasy yeah, I'm yeah. personally always a fan of fantasy and can never get enough of it. <laughs> and I find it's more uh, accessible with books than it is necessarily with TV and film. So that became a, quite a bookworm over my love of fantasy. Oh, you're a, a love Harry Potter. Yes. So, so, so do I. <laughs> so, you know, I, wanna, I just want to circle back a little bit because you have, as an OT, Mm -hmm. a lot of meaningful occupations that you love. And 
We yeah. know that in, occupa in occupational therapy lingo, an occupation is a meaningful everyday activity that you do. So, you know, you loved working with people. Um, you love having your cable television show, those musings. I think it's well, see, amazing. I paint. I painted and this cover. And that's what I wanted to ask. That's what yeah. I wanted to ask. <laughs> <laughs> you wrote the book. I wrote and, the book. And you are the illustrator of the covers. Yeah. Look at all of these things that you're yeah, doing. The, it's the, pretty amazing. This cover was kind of interesting because I had found Kim. She um, is in uh, a museum called Remnants of War in Saigon, and her image has been used over 250 times on games and books and all kinds of things. She's sort of like a public domain image. But for Sam's West Coast Adventure, I had this image of this statue that's um, in the Gloucester Art Museum. It's a maquette of a huge sculpture of the fallen railroad worker. And it's an angel holding up this fallen railroad worker. And I looked at that angel and I thought, that's Sam. Well, it's a sculpture. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I wanted a person. And so I went on an internet search for all these different images. No, that guy's got the right eyes. No, this guy's got the right jaw. Oh, wait a minute, I like that hair. No, there's the correct black leather jacket. And so I have this image um, of all these male fantasies, okay? <laughs> no, they have to be hotties. It's a love story, okay? <laughs> so, you know, the core character of the series, Marge, who you meet in middle age in the in the first book and she flips back to being a teenager and then you meet her again meeting the veterans when they come home from the war she's in this book as a young woman and then again as an older woman because there's this time thing going on so it's yeah it's kind of cool so um he had to be a hottie. He, no, he, he, he had to be a hottie. Boys are always better in books. That was my motto. Oh. <laughs> no, no, no. You're not old uh -oh. enough yet. Mine is better in real life. 37 years and counting. No, really. My name isn't love for nothing. Oh, that's cute. Oh, we're going to have to start wrapping up, though. Oh, Marjorie, sorry. Thank you so much for joining us. And it was such a pleasure to hear about your career and your writing, your show, um, so many interesting things going on. And I want to encourage all of our viewers to check in your show, check out your book on Amazon. Two books. Bo books on Amazon. Mm -hmm. um, and thank you again for joining us. We are doing this program as a part of Thursday Night Live. We talked about the cable show. And we encourage others, if you ever picture yourself in this chair or perhaps behind the scenes learning the technical aspect of how to produce a show, that is something you can do in your community. If you live in Brookline, that's something you can do here. So we encourage you to check out brooklineinteractive.org. And um, you know, if you enjoyed the show, we have other episodes online. So you can see it on cable, you can see it on the internet. Thank you again for joining us, and thank you, Marjan. Thank you. Thank You're you, very welcome. Thank you.